I did warn you I couldn't play it. Please do be seated. Uh, and for this evening, I'm cheating because I'm going to read from 1 Timothy, uh, something that I looked, and we've got about six weeks to do 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Uh, and I've probably got 12 or 13 sermons that I would want to preach out of those two books. So uh, I'm cheating. And one, one for this evening from 1 Timothy chapter 5, um, where it says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion to practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. But no woman may be put on the list of widows until she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, don't put them on such a list. Tonight, uh, our question is, what could I say about growing older? Uh, that's uh, perhaps a little personal to me at this time, but also I, I remember the time when I was doing Boys Brigade camp when I was first a minister. So I was 32 perhaps years old, and we had a game of Hacker, which is that barbaric game that Boys Brigade play uh, sometimes with sort of like hockey, but with no rules. Um, and I took a, a, a crack on the knee, which was proving painful. And I went to the, the wife of our Boys Brigade captain was uh, a GP, not my GP, but, but we were uh, she was there, and I said, Jane, look, I, I have a lot of trouble with this knee. And she looked at me in all seriousness. She was probably 30 at the time, and she said to me, Peter, there comes a time as you get older when you just don't heal as quickly as you used to. And, and the truth is, we're all growing older all the time. Um, somebody said, today's the oldest you've ever been, uh, and it's the youngest you'll ever be again. We're all growing older. Uh, it affects us in at least four ways. Um, biologically, our bodies, our senses, our, our health can deteriorate. Psychologically, our, our mental ability can decline slowly. Socially, many people interact less as they get older. Uh, our activities, our ability to cope independently can be restricted. So getting older does affect people. Um, but there are some good things about growing older, as I know that you've all discovered. I can't just phrase that very wrongly. You get better at using what you've learned. Apparently this is called crystallized intelligence. If you know something, you can use it better. Uh, it's said that most people become nicer as they grow older, uh, less grumpy, less angry, more happy, getting on better with other people than they did when they were younger. Um, uh, as circumstances change, fewer family responsibilities, perhaps when we give up work, many people feel less stress or pressure than they have earlier in life. Uh, and as long as folk pace themselves, of course, they can remain productive. Um, many folk, it said, find that they enjoy their own company more than they used to when they were younger, but of course, the older you get, the more family and friends, you miss them because they're not there anymore. Within most of our lifetimes, more than a quarter of the UK population will be over 65. Uh, on average, older people have enough money, a significant proportion we have to recognise don't. 
Um, in the workplace, a third of workers are over 50. Uh, interestingly, in public services, in, in key workers, uh, a greater proportion of older, more experienced workers. Uh, over 50, uh, very often very active in giving unpaid care or in volunteering. And I didn't realize this, but 65 to 75s are the most active age in volunteering for things. Uh, and over 50s count for more than half of consumer spending, holidays, restaurants, travel, all of that. But growing older has its downsides. Our bodies change. People are physically less strong, less stamina. Uh, folk tend to experience problems with their health more often. Some, this affects their minds, their memories. And many folk sadly find they become more fearful, more anxious as the years go on, perhaps because they feel less confident in coping whatever life might throw at them. And this can grow uh, after somebody's had an accident, a fall, an injury, an illness. This uncertainty, this lack of confidence can grow. And many people, we have to remember in later years, do find their lives overshadowed with grief, having lost probably their parents, their friends, their spouse. Uh, and also there is anticipatory grief for their own death. So uh, everything we said about how we cope with grief, what we can do to help someone with grief, will often be relevant with an older person. Uh, this is aggravated because in, in our Western uh, society, um, folk are living much longer, um, but families are often fragmented. Uh, many older people are living alone, which they would not have done in previous generations, and for some that's a challenge. When it comes to growing older, I've got one consistent message from the Bible. Page after page tells us this, that older people should be respected and honored and valued and cared for. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. Uh, Leviticus 19, I like this one. Uh, it's been a shock. Last time we were in uh, Austria, last holiday abroad we had, and um, I got on a bus and this young man stood up and gave me his seat. I thought, there may be some merits in growing older. Leviticus 19, 25, stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, revere your Lord. I am the Lord. A respect for older folk. Uh, Proverbs talks about the respect children should show for their parents. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adore your neck. Respect for parents. Uh, for some strange reason, I quite like Proverbs 30, verse 17. The eye that mocks a father and scorns an aged mother will be plucked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. No, no, that just sort of rang, rang true to me. Jesus himself quoted the fifth commandment in Matthew 15. God said, honor your father and mother. And then he quoted another Old Testament passage, anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Uh, that's Leviticus 20. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death because they have cursed their father or mother. Their blood will be on their own heads. So the Bible is uh, consistent, commanding honor and respect for older people. And in contrast to the Bible's view, society today often fails to show that appropriate respect for older people. On the contrary, there's often prejudice discrimination against older people. Uh, this is labeled ageism, uh, stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination against people on the basis of them being older. It's widespread, it's a damaging problem, harmful effects on those adults and on uh, society as a whole. And you can see it structural 
institutional ageism um, against old people. Uh, manifests in many forms. You'll find it in the workplace, in patterns of promotion, or in uh, uh, recruitment processes. Um, you find ageism in access to health services, in care provision. Uh, ageism in stereotypes on television, advertising, in the marketing of products. Um, ageism which pits one age group against another. Uh, reducing people to stereotypes, a particularly appallingly ageist, inaccurate, unjust. When older age is represented as a time of frailty, inevitable decline, um, ageism can lead some people to limit what they try to do. Uh, it limits the ways that some people are able to enjoy a later life. Um, and Christians should stand against these kinds of ageism. I was challenged um, as I just read a leaflet. Uh, we should speak of an older person, of older people. We shouldn't say an old person or old people. We shouldn't talk about OAPs, old age pensioners, uh, or the elderly as if they are a group of people different from the rest of us, because they are not. We should really resist the ideas that an aging population is, they use words, a grey tsunami or a silver tsunami, a demographic, uh, a demographic cliff we're about to drop off, a, a demographic time bomb. Uh, stereotyping older people, uh, portraying a wrong idea of what older years uh, is about portraying the baby boomer generation as, as a growing burden on society, these ideas are damaging. They're unfair, they're untrue. Oprah Winfrey said this, we live in a youth-obsessed culture that is constantly trying to tell us that if we're not young, we're not glowing, we're not hot, that doesn't, that we don't matter. And she says, I refuse to let a system or a culture or a distorted view of reality tell me that I don't matter. I know that only by owning who and what you are can you start to make a step into the fullness of life. I think she's right. Society devalues the older people. And there are systemic problems in the way that society is viewing growing old they attract the attitudes of younger people towards those of us who are more miles on the clock. Archbishop Rowan Williams said this, quite a lot of our contemporary culture is actually shot through with a resentment of limits and the passage of time, anger <laughs> at what we can't do, fear, or even disgust at growing old. I think he's right. It affects the way that older people see themselves and it affects the way in which younger people see older people. And we should stand out as Christians as different by showing older people the love and respect which the Bible commands. We should stand alongside, stand up for older people. And in a society which is marginalizing older people, we must really make sure that we don't fall into those traps in the life of the church. So I think it's good that we should ask ourselves what more could we be doing as a church to support older people. Uh, some of that could be helping folk who are struggling through grief. Some of it could explore ways that we can support those who are caring for older relatives and friends. But individually and as a church, we have to make sure that we demonstrate that older people are valued. We must support them in their independence. We've got to be sensitive as we introduce changes into the life of the church. I, I look back and realize mistakes that I've made over the years in that. Older friends can find change harder. Um, and sometimes when we want to make changes in the church, uh, it can give our older friends the impression that we uh, 
are criticizing the way things used to be. We have to be very clear that's not what we're saying. In the Bible, older people are respected simply because they're older. The elders in the community and the church uh, commanded respect just because they were older. In contrast, ageism in our culture means that older people and their wisdom are devalued. Came across a quote which, which struck a chord with me. Growing old is when you know all the answers, but nobody asks you the questions. The Bible sees the opposite. Job 12, is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? It's sad to see so many examples in society, in business, even in the church, handing too much responsibility to young people too early and things don't always work out well. Came across this fascinating story in the book of Kings. Do you remember this one? Deserves a whole sermon in itself. It's only going to get a couple of minutes now, but I'll, let me summarize the story. King Solomon died. His two sons fought over the kingdom, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Remember them? Uh, and the people were complaining we read in, in 1 Kings 12, King Rehoboam consulted the elders who'd served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people who are complaining, he said. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who'd grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what's your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke that your father put upon us? And the young men who'd grown up with him said, tell these people who've said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke i will make it even heavier my father scourged you with whips i will scourge you with scorpions so we read in in 1 kings 12 verse 13 the king answered the people harshly rejecting the advice given him by the elders he followed the advice of the young men and it did not end well there is a parable which i think has power for today uh, young people ignore the wisdom of their elders to everybody's peril. And sadly, that's happening in churches as well as in society at large. So as a church, as Christians, we should be supporting older people in any ways we can, not just spiritually, but in practical ways. Um, and that brings us to, to the reading in uh, 1 Timothy. Um, in many places in the Old Testament, I've talked before about the way that God commands uh, the people of Israel to look after three particular groups of people, uh, the widows, the orphans, the refugees. Uh, and we see that in practice in uh, 1 Timothy 5, where Paul gives this example of a widow's list, people being supported financially by the church. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need, the widow is really in need and left alone, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. Um, we see there in, in 1 Timothy 5, we also see it in Acts 6, that from the earliest days of the first Christians, the churches had systems in place to help those in the church who had um, needs, particularly for widows. Of course, no church would have infinite resources. No church had a bottomless purse. So it is interesting that Paul gives a list of criteria which should be used to decide whether a widow should be added to the widow's list or not. He says no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she's over 60, has been faithful to her husband, is well known for her good needs, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. This was not a bottomless purse, but this was care for those in the church who'd reached a certain age and needed the support of the church. 
it was only for those who had no other means of support. Uh, because Paul lays out in uh, 1 Timothy 5 the responsibility that children and grandchildren would have for caring for their own family. If a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, so repaying their parents and grandparents for those, for this is pleasing to God. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In the Bible, the primary responsibility for providing for people as they grew older lay with their family, their children, their grandchildren would be giving them a home, providing their food, taking care of their medical needs. And, and this was the pattern, even in Britain, uh, into the 20th century. Still is in many places around the world today. For us, there are different factors that have come in. Um, for one thing, city life is very different from rural life. People often are now living a long way away from their parents rather than uh, where they grew up. Life expectancy is much longer. Um, families tend to have fewer children. Both parents often have demanding jobs. So how do we apply these scriptures to us, to our society today, this responsibility to look after your parents, grandparents? I think we do need to see the difference between society then, community then, and now. Uh, and I suppose I've seen this most directly in, in Uganda and in Zambia. Where the children and the grandchildren are still living in the same village as the parents. They've not gone away. They're, they're living there. Where parents may have had six or eight or ten children and um, maybe two or three of those children have died um, but the responsibility for looking after the parents rests not with one or two siblings but with six or seven all of whom were living in in the community um, We've had to work through for ourselves, many of us, balancing the responsibilities that we have as parents to our own children, to our, to our jobs, uh, with the task of supporting parents who may be hundreds or even thousands of miles away. Just a couple of reflections. The reality is that in today's world, there are many other people who are able to take care of the practical needs of an elderly person. Um, the National Health Service is there, care homes are there, social services are there. Only the children, only the grandchildren can share the memories with the parent, can spend what we would call quality time with them. And I do believe that it can be appropriate, even wise, to turn to the welfare state, to turn to care homes, to provide for our parents' practical needs, rather than children, grandchildren, using the little time that they have available to deal with practical matters. And so not have time, actually, to talk with the parents, the grandparents. Personally, I won't be looking for my children to look after me, uh, to get them, expect them to take me to live with them, uh, to feed me and clothe me and dress me. If it comes to that stage, for me, I'd rather um, other people dealt with those practical matters and my kids and my grandkids just come and spend time with me when they can. As far as the church supporting older people is concerned, we've got to struggle to find a balance between two very important things, between pastoral care and evangelism. Um, because the fact is, as we grow older, even day by day, we face the prospect of dying. 
Uh, I like what Michael Caine said. Um, to me, growing old is great. It's the very best thing, considering the alternative. <laughs> and we are called to show Christian love, community, offering pastoral care, practical care support to older people. But there is also the challenge, which is often neglected, which is to proclaim the gospel to them. Um, some folk think that it's, it's insensitive, it is uh, uncaring to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to folk in their later years. But if they haven't heard the gospel and responded before too long, it will be too late. And caring for older friends has to involve sharing the good news of Jesus with them. What could we say about growing older? Um, a few bits of advice, a few words of gems of wisdom. All kinds of myths out there about how to age successfully. Um, it's often not the case that a person chooses how they cope with getting older. It's often circumstances impose different paths in life on them. Uh, it's often more about their environment or the support that they receive or don't receive than, than personal choice. But there are a few uh, words of wisdom for you young people out there on Zoom, in, 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 in Facebook land, uh, advice as we're all getting older, keep on taking the exercise. Doctors will, will always tell you that. Um, keep up with the tech. I think those who are with us on Zoom tonight and on Facebook uh, who are perhaps a little older are able to do that because you have kept up with the tech. The world is, is moving on. Get your children, your grandchildren, your friends to explain how these new gadgets work. Because as the world moves on, there are things in it that are, that are new, that are different. And you can either just let them pass you by or you can choose to wrestle with them. Keep up with the tech. Keep on learning new things, people say. Um, Judge Bernard Shaw says we don't stop playing because we grow old, we grow old because we stop playing. Uh, Walt Disney said laughter is timeless, imagination has no age, dreams are forever. Keep on playing, keep on learning new things. And C.S. Lewis said you're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. We're never too old, by God's grace, to do whatever God calls us to do. Abraham was 75 years old when God called him to leave his home, set out in faith on the journey where he wasn't even told the destination. Moses was 80 years old when God called him to lead his chosen people out of slavery in Egypt. 120 years old when he was standing on the edge of the promised land, having led them for 40 years through the wilderness. Uh, who knows what God can call us to do in our later years? Let's not assume that being of a certain age means we can't serve God any longer. But there may come a time when we're less physically active. That will give us more time to pray, to meditate, to study scripture. There may come a time when we're not in a position to attempt very many great things for God. We can still seek to draw close to God. We can still be aspiring uh, to grow in grace, uh, in wisdom, in character, strive to become more like Jesus. I'm reminded of the uh, epitaph on the grave of a great Sherpa guide in, in the Himalayas. Um, he died climbing. We should all still be climbing to become more like Jesus year by year until he calls us to be with himself. Billy Graham said, when granted many years of life, growing old in age is natural, but growing old with grace is a choice. Growing older with grace is possible for all who will set their hearts and minds on the giver of grace.
the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help us as a church to show proper honor and respect to those who are older. Uh, and may God help us, each one of us, as the years go by, to continue to see him more clearly, to love him more dearly, to follow him more nearly day by day. Let's spend